We've had five weeks off, and uh, seriously, I didn't know if anyone would remember this class was meeting, but uh, I'm happy that you found your way here. We have three weeks left, count them. Uno, dos, tres. I'm working on my Espanol. In fact, I mentioned to you, I think, uh, some weeks back that I was going to be speaking at a pastor's conference in southern Mexico the first week of June or so. And so I would really appreciate your prayers. I've never done this speaking through a translator, the whole deal, you know, so um, let alone things like Montezuma's Revenge, whatever that is, I just don't know what uh, to expect. But anyway, I'm, I'm excited about this and I'd appreciate your prayers as I'm preparing for it and looking forward to it. But we have unfinished business in connection with the American Revolution and the Presbyterians and their role in it, and of course, more broadly, the Calvinists, which really is about two-thirds of the population, were either Calvinists or descendants from them, and still had very much that outlook in their DNA, even if they weren't quite as orthodox in their Calvinism as others had been of an earlier generation. And so we uh, have been noting, at least to some degree, the role that we played in the run-up to that great conflict. And one character that we've talked about along the way, of course, is George Whitfield. We're coming this morning to 1770, which happens to be the year that he died. And he died here in the colonies. And so I'd like to spend just a couple of minutes giving a little bit of a, uh, a quick uh, summary of what took place toward the end of his career. We've mentioned him, of course, on and off all through. He's been here and there 13 times, back and forth, one-way trips across the Atlantic Ocean, preaching both in England and in the colonies, and just nonstop. I, I, by far, every day of his life, he preached multiple sermons. He's one of the most remarkable sermonizing machines that I think the human race has ever encountered. And he uh, sort of spent the last tour preaching here in the colonies, and in fact, uh, was preaching up to the day before he died. And so we uh, have a, a, a significant interest in him, and I'd like to highlight that as we get going. But as I was thinking about that, thinking about the role of uh, George Whitfield, and he himself had some sense that he was nearing the end. I think he had an idea that his own physical capacities were beginning to be taxed uh, beyond the point that he could continue. And uh, as I was thinking about that, it reminded me of the Apostle Paul, who very much had a similar experience, although in Paul's case, he was in a Roman prison and had been sentenced to die, and he knew that the day of his execution was looming large. And it was in that context there, in that uh, very unhappy sort of Roman dungeon situation, it was no longer house arrest now, but uh, he was in much less comfortable circumstances that he wrote his last letter. And it's the letter, one of the pastoral epistles, as they're called, to his young protege, pastor, friend, uh, traveling companion through the years, Timothy, 2 Timothy, probably the last thing Paul wrote, at least the last thing we're, we're aware of that he wrote. And in that letter, he gave what is commonly called his valedictory. And it's a remarkable brief paragraph, and I think probably George Whitfield may have had this text course through his mind occasionally as well, as he was thinking of uh, his own possible uh, soon uh, departure from this world. So anyway, this is uh, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning at verse 6, the Word of God. Paul says, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I've fought the good fight. I've kept the face. I've finished the course. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not only to me, but to all of those who have loved his appearing. Remarkable words from a remarkable man. They've been certainly words that have been echoing through many other saints down through history including our friend George Whitfield. So let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer and we'll get started. Our Father, we're deeply grateful for the individuals that you've brought along, millions of them whose names we will not know this side of eternity. But occasionally you raise up a few and you cause them to be those that 
really changed the very course, as we can tell, of history. And we certainly know that Whitfield was one of those. And so we give you thanks for the gift that he was to the people who were his contemporaries as well as to us. And we pray that our brief thoughts about his life this morning would be true to the facts, but also a proper testimony to your grace in his life. And for that, we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is Whitfield's last tour. He arrived early in 1770, uh, returning here for the last time. He is, always has been, died right to the last breath he took, an old-fashioned Calvinist, a Calvinist evangelist. I know some people think that's an oxymoron. Personally, I don't see how you could be evangelist unless you're a Calvinist, but that's just me. But that's the way he saw it too. He preached fervent evangelistic messages precisely because he was a, a Calvinist and believed that God already had his people out there and those thousands that had gathered to hear him. And it only took hearing the word of God for them to have their hearts changed. As Whitfield was touring the colonies, he was welcomed everywhere as probably the most admired man in the colonies at that time. He had started as an embattled, controversial character. He had many enemies. And though not everybody fully agreed with him by the time of his departure from this world, he nevertheless met thousands of people along the way, everywhere he stopped, who gathered to celebrate the man, to hear him preach, and to uh, really express their appreciation for the way in which he had been so instrumental in the colonial history up until that time. It rather reminds me of, of, of um, uh, John Wesley in England, who had a similar kind of experience. Uh, John Wesley was very much embattled at the beginning, controversial, demonized in the press, accused of all kinds of outrageous uh, abuses and crimes. But by the time he died in the late 1700s, he was unquestionably the most admired man in England. You could see his picture everywhere. People had beer mugs with John Wesley's image on them. I mean, it was just everywhere. You couldn't escape it. And in some ways, George Whitfield was something like that in the colonies. He was British, he was Anglican. Notwithstanding all of that, he was richly loved, but he was controversial. And as we've highlighted to you before, he was especially controversial at the point of advocating much, much better treatment of the slaves in the colonies. He was very much aware of the abusive treatment to which they had been subjected, and he called for many, many reforms, some of which were viewed as, as frankly, radical. Things like slaves should be educated, and he built schools for the education of slave children. I think he knew what all of us know, that education would be the key to freedom. He never outright called for the abolition of slavery. We might regret that, probably should. But I think in some ways his tactics were a slightly more subtle, had a more long-term trajectory to them, and ultimately they won the day, although it took a bloody war to make it happen. But he called for the abolition of, uh, of, of not for the abolition, he called for the education of, of slaves, he called for better treatment of them, better uh, provisions for them in various ways. And for that, he was loved by uh, the slave population. They viewed him as a great hero and really celebrated his life as well. He also had a strong friendship with Benjamin Franklin all through the years. And these two spent a lot of time together. I think it's safe to say that George Whitfield never changed his theology a bit over the 30 years. Ben Franklin changed his quite a bit over those 30 years. This is sometimes not highlighted very adequately, but I think it's perfectly clear as you survey his life. Uh, ben Franklin started off as kind of a child of the Enlightenment. He was a nominal Presbyterian, but much more touched by rationalism, deism, uh, kind of self-made human sort of enterprises that uh, would help us uh, usher in a new day. By the end of his career, we have a very different Ben Franklin on our hands. When he was at the Constitutional Convention in the late 17, or in the 1780s, he was the one who said, we're never gonna get this done unless we pray. 
He was the one who said, unless we have divine providence that enter into these conversations as we try to thread the needle of getting the balances we need in this constitutional uh, sort of invention that we're about, we need God's help and we need it here and we need it now. And I'm gonna tell you something, a deist would never say that. It takes someone who believes that God is with us, not out there in some distant uh, sort of uncaring status who could say such things. And it was Ben Franklin who moved the entire convention to leave their facilities and go down to a church and to enter on their knees in prayer in that church that God would actually work among them to bring about some idea of how they could put together a constitution that would survive the test of time. Ben Franklin was responsible for that. The two of them probably never quite got to the same page theologically, but they were very much on the same page politically. They both had a vision of the politics of liberty and they both were champions of it all through the years. Uh, uh, Whitfield also renewed his friendship with his uh, longtime companion, traveling companion, uh, supporter William Tennant, who we've talked about. William Tennant had for years been the pastor of the Second Presbyterian Church there in Philadelphia. He was heavily involved in the College of New Jersey that eventually became Princeton. He was a remarkably important man, very well known at the time, and certainly the relationship between those two was most important as well. Well, this last tour of uh, George Whitfield and the colonies was a bit of a whirlwind tour. He maintained an amazing pace, preaching multiple times a day. He'd preach, get on a horseback, go the next place, preach, horseback ride, next place, preach, uh, depriving himself of proper rest, probably proper nutrition. He just was uh, kind of doing, uh, you might almost say a a Herculean kind of superhuman uh, effort at uh, trying to make one last sweep through the colonies. Everywhere he went, he was met by crowds that cheered him in vast ovations. This is well documented. Thousands of people coming to express their appreciation for this man as he uh, was traveling along uh, from south to north in this last tour. J.D. Dickey says he maintained a breakneck devotion to preaching even as his health began to decline. And he was warmly and fervently received everywhere uh, he went as an honorary son of America. Uh, When he reached Boston, which I think we probably understand is sort of ground zero for the revolutionary spirit. Boston was really in some ways where the most intense expressions of oppression took place and where uh, by the same token you have this kind of rising sense of a need for separation. He was impressed by the abuses that were quite evident there in Boston. He was also very sympathetic to the rising anger of the Bostonians as they were living through a kind of uh, oppressive and really abusive uh, presence of the British at that time. Uh, Whitfield himself said, poor New England is much to be pitied, Boston people most of all, how grossly misrepresented. He said the great mischiefs, the poor pious people suffered lately through the towns being disturbed by the soldiers. He joined many voices in Boston in calling for opposition to and separation from uh, the King of England. This is still pretty early in terms of the revolutionary conflict, but he went on record believing that the only way out of this would be some kind of political separation and independence. Uh, He was strongly opposed, though he was an Anglican priest to the day he died, he was strongly opposed to the imposing of Anglican authority. He didn't want kind of the established church to have a presence that would reduce every other religion in the colonies to a second-class status. He believed in religious liberty, and he was a champion of it, and he believed that this uh, desire in England to impose sort of official religion in the colonies would be very much misguided. Again, Dickey says, it was this version of the gospel that shook the social bonds and threatened the hierarchy of the wealthy and powerful. So, George Whitfield, he arrives in Massachusetts. He always said, one of his little mottos, he wanted to wear out rather than rust out, you know. I used to joke when I was a classroom teacher the last few years of my working life. Uh, I taught high schoolers, you know, a variety of topics, and, I, and they would always joke, 
This was when I, they, I was still young enough that they could joke about how old I was, you know. Eventually, I got so old, I didn't hear the jokes anymore. You know what I'm saying? You know, I got more truth than poetry there. And, but anyway, I used to joke with them that uh, my ideal way of dying would just be to keel over dead in class in the middle of an important point in theology to just, you know, bam, wouldn't that be a great way to go? I thought it never happened. So now I'm, I've revised it. I want to keel over dead in Sunday school someday. So I hope, uh, I hope you might be here to witness that. And, uh, you know, but anyway, one way or another, um, uh, this was his motto. He wanted to wear out. He preached his last sermon on September 29th, 1770. That night he jotted down in his journal that he was preaching in a field, which was his preferred venue, on top of what he called a large barrel. That was the kind of trappings that George Whitfield preferred. And so standing on top of some kind of barrel, I don't know exactly what it looked like, he preached to thousands of people who were there to hear this, and in fact, he died the next day. He died on September 30th, 1770, died in a parsonage which was attached to Old South Presbyterian Church, Newburyport, Massachusetts. I claim George Whitfield as an honorary Presbyterian, you know? I mean, after all, he died in a Presbyterian parsonage. That should do the trick right there. But uh, besides that, he was very much loved by the Presbyterians and the colonies and generally despised by the Anglicans. So I think we deserve to claim him. And, uh, and so I'm going to exercise that prerogative. If you happen to be in the neighborhood sometime of the place where he died, you'll find a lovely plaque there that celebrates his life and the place where he uh, finally went to be with the Lord. The language on this plaque was written by Whitfield himself, and it reads as follows, quote, I am content to wait till the day of judgment for the clearing up of my character. He knew he was controversial. He knew that even as he was approaching his death, there were people in the colonies who didn't care for his thinking very much. And as widely respected as he was, he appreciated that and took it seriously. And he was not about to go on some kind of big campaign to defend himself. He was willing to leave it in God's hands. He said, after I am dead, I desire no other epitaph than this. Here lies GW, what sort of man he was, the great day will discover. And uh, I think uh, history has, whatever the great day may disclose, has vindicated the service he provided and we have all been, whether we know it or not, the beneficiaries of this gift that was given to us back in the colonial period. About 7,000 people attended, the uh, 6,000 rather, attended the funeral of uh, George Whitfield. The major eulogy was offered by Benjamin Franklin himself. However, many others, as you can imagine, spoke at this ceremony, which lasted several hours. Some of those who spoke were in fact slaves or former slaves who got up and celebrated the impact this man had had on their own circumstances in the colonies. That the influence had been one that had benefited them personally and there were many expressions of appreciation for that. His legacy I hardly need to say too much about. I think you know that uh, from this point on he was warmly remembered uh, by virtually everybody in the colonies. The first biography of his life was written by a Presbyterian, a Scott Presbyterian named John Gillis. He based it on the rather voluminous journals of George Whitfield. It was entitled Memoirs of George Whitfield. It's clear enough when you read this biography that he loved America. The evidence is pretty clear that America loved him. He was celebrated as a colonial son. He preached the gospel. He opposed British abuses. He has been regarded generally as an honorary American in the national spirit uh, from that time to this. Uh, there were many poems that were written celebrating Whitfield, but one that was pretty well known was actually written back in the mid 1750s, but was again repeated at his funeral and became one of the better known expressions of appreciation for the man. And it reads as follows. Is blessed Whitfield come again? Our heart does now rejoice. We pray good people all attend and hear his lovely voice. For 14 years he has been tried by enemies and friends, and now upon this new return, the heavenly sound, it rings. <clears throat> and so with that, we'll bid goodbye for the time.
to George Whitfield. Something else that happened in 1770 that probably should, uh, we should note at least in passing is commonly called the Boston Massacre, you know. Uh, Whitfield was aware of it. He died in September. This took place earlier that year, March 5th. I noted that there was this rather palpable rising hostility in Boston, something like ground zero, of the place where there was hostility, but it was mixed with the abusive treatment that the folks there in Boston believed they were experiencing. There were two parliamentary acts in particular that were exacerbating the tension in Boston. One of them is called the Quartering Act. The Quartering Act was enacted by Parliament in 1765. It applied across the colonies, but was, was implemented the most vigorously in Boston. And so they felt it probably with the greatest kind of a bite. The Quartering Act said that the colonies had to be uh, occupied. There needed to be British military forces conspicuous and visible in the colonies, and that was especially true in Boston. That probably would have been bad enough, except that the Quartering Act also provided that these British forces must be supported at colonial expense. And so the colonists were required to pay the expenses for barracks, for food, for sustenance, for maintenance of their equipment. This was all uh, tagged to the colonists. And if there didn't happen to be sufficient uh, military barracks, then it meant, the Quartering Act said, that these military types could take over private residences. And so uh, they could just come to your house, knock on the door, and uh, sort of politely move you right out of your dwelling, take over your food, take over your facilities, sleep in your bed, and so on. You can imagine that did not really run, you know, do much for their popularity. And uh, this was the kind of thing that was happening, and it was especially happening, of course, in the region of Boston, Massachusetts, New England, and so on. So the Quartering Act had already exacerbated the situation fairly dramatically. Then you add what's called the Townsend Act. The Townsend Act, two years later, again enacted by Parliament, was a replacement for the Stamp Act. The Stamp Act was a direct tax on people. Ben Franklin grabbed George Whitfield, the two of them raced across the ocean, and Ben Franklin interceded on behalf of the colonists in front of Parliament, you recall we talked about that, and got Parliament to rescind and repeal the Stamp Act, which was good news. But soon enough, Parliament came in with kind of an end run called the Townsend Act. The Townsend Act was an indirect tax, meaning people weren't being taxed, but goods were being taxed. So everything that was being imported into the colonies had a little tax on it, sometimes just nickel and dime stuff, sometimes more weighty. And that gave rise to then tax collectors who were supposed to be here and make sure the tax was being collected on all of these commodities that were being sold uh, based on imports into the colonies. The tax collectors in the colonies were about as popular as the publicans in the New Testament, you know. Uh, they weren't necessarily very well loved, and sometimes they felt somewhat imperiled. The tax collectors felt sometimes that their personal health might be at risk, and it could be it was. And so the tax collectors had British troops that were assigned to be something like bodyguards for them as they went around collecting the tax. All right. Well, on one occasion, you have a character who was here as a, as a British military bodyguard, I'm going to call him, who was there assigned to the task of protecting one of these tax collectors. But he kind of got off by himself, I don't know what happened, and he was surrounded by some very threatening Bostonians who singled him out and began to harass him, I believe would be the right word to use, protesting him and threatening him in a way that he was feeling somewhat imperiled. And he was able to whistle and get some other guys to come over, so a total of seven British troops came to more or less rescue this one fellow. The Bostonians at that point, I'm not, don't shoot the messenger, I'm just telling you what happened, ladies and gentlemen, but 
the Bostonians picked up snowballs and began to throw them. But pretty soon the snowballs started looking a little bit like rocks and other items that could do a little bit of damage. Some shots were fired, and when the dust settled, three Bostonians were dead. Two others died a little later of gunshot wounds. All right, so that's what happened. Five people dead as a result of this confrontation. Well, you can imagine, depending on your politics, you'll have two very different perspectives on how to interpret that event. Now, when George III in England heard about it, he immediately blamed Samuel Adams, who he styled the most dangerous man in America. You know, we've seen that before. Uh, He viewed this as well-deserved. It was a perfectly reasonable, rational reaction by well-trained military forces that were there and, and they were to be commended for having done what they did. So that was the king's interpretation of what happened. The colonial response was a little bit different. I flashed this up too fast. I was going to quiz you as to whether you knew off the top of your head who represented the troops who had fired the guns that killed the Bostonians. And I know I I beat you to it. Did you know already, Ron? John Adams, that's right. Uh, John Adams, at the height of his legal career, about 35 years old at this point, believed what any good lawyer does believe, that even if, you, if it seems like the case against you is, is open and closed, you deserve a defense. John Adams, this is what you call a career-limiting move, you know. Uh, this was probably the most unpopular position any lawyer could put himself in, or herself, although there weren't many female lawyers at that time, <coughs> in, uh, in terms of representing a defendant. John Adams was vilified across the colonies for being willing to represent these British troops. But he believed that, especially given it would be a colonial jury, right, who you would expect might have a little bit of bias, John Adams felt, you know, these guys deserved a fair shake. And so, as a matter of fact, he represented them and uh, got them off. John Adams, trying the case to a colonial jury, was able to convince them that the actions of these guys under the circumstances was reasonable and justified, really represented self-defense, and that on that basis uh, they should not be held responsible for any criminal act. The jury agreed, the jury agreed unanimously once they saw what happened and heard the evidence. You can imagine not everybody in the colonies quite saw it that way, you know. And uh, there was widespread condemnation, including John Adams' cousin, Samuel Adams, who absolutely went apoplectic when he heard that these guys had been acquitted. And he was almost beside himself as he decried that verdict in print uh, in the journal that he maintained that we've talked about before. Charles Chauncey, Uh, The seasonable revolutionary we've talked about condemned this outcome, couldn't believe his ears when he heard that they'd been acquitted. This is Charles Chauncey, who's generally a kind of balanced guy, you know, who said, quote, if I was to be one of the jury upon that soldier's trial, I would find him guilty, evidence or no evidence. You know, I just like that guy on your jury. (laughs) So so this, uh, this was his view. There was a public call for a condemnation of these guys in spite of the verdict, almost a call for a lynching. I mean, that was kind of the atmosphere. Uh, And so you can imagine it did add a little bit of an additional element of of, uh, condemnation, of of, uh, a sense of resentment against the British, but uh, that is the Boston Massacre. All right, well, that's 1770. I want to move to 1771 and focus in on a little detail of history, which uh, is not well known, uh, and uh, yet it does involve something of the story that we've been telling along the way. So I'd like to uh, talk about a little bit Samuel Hopkins. Uh, I've mentioned him before. He was a young man who was uh, apprenticed under Jonathan Edwards back in the early 1740s. He was there for two or three years. That was something like his seminary, you know, studying under Jonathan Edwards. Doesn't get much better than that. 
Then he went out and became a pastor of a Native American church, Housatonic tribe, and he'd been there for about 25 years. So Samuel Hopkins has been working away, kind of laboring in a fairly obscure setting, uh, and now he enters our picture at this point in 1771, connected with a church in Newport, Rhode Island, which was called First Church. It's a congregational church, and it was probably one of the, well, it was certainly one of the better known churches, maybe the best known church in the city, a good sized church and with a good reputation. But in 1771, it became clear that the pastor was sort of losing touch. It does happen occasionally. Uh, he appeared to have a drinking problem. Uh, he appeared to be developing a little bit of what we might call paranoia. It seemed that he was really losing his grip on a good balanced ministry until finally he was dismissed. Uh, the board of the church gathered and, and so on. And as his, uh, sort of his parting shot, as he was leaving his ministry at that church, he blamed the whole thing on a woman I've mentioned a few times named Sarah Osborne. Now she was originally Sarah Wheaton. Uh, she married, became Sarah Osborne, and uh, she had had an interesting ongoing career in the church herself. So I've dropped her name in along the way once or twice to just to tell you I wanted to come back and talk about her at a later time. We are now at a later time. So I want to give you a little bit of uh, what happened here. It's a remarkable story. Sarah Osborne, Wheaton at the time, heard George Whitfield preach, was powerfully affected by it, as were most people that heard him. This was back, back in the 40s. She was in Massachusetts there in Newport. And uh, it really did change her life. Uh, at least spiritually, and she became a rather devoted uh, student of the scripture. She was never very well to do and never very in good health. She had uh, some health problems along the way that were significant. Uh, she married a man named Osborne who died, but from that marriage there was a son who also died. This was about the year 1750. And so she'd had tragedy upon tragedy. It was a sad case. Her heart was really uh, seeking the Lord. It was, you know, it's a situation where life is so painful, you can hardly uh, survive, and yet she was trying to be as faithful as she could. And somebody gave her a gift, which will strike you probably, as it does me, as a rather odd gift, but in the culture of the day, it's probably understandable, gave her the gift of a slave. The slave was about four years old. His name was Bobby. Uh, he was the son of another slave, a woman named Phyllis, who was also a member of First Church. This, there were slave members in that church. And so Phyllis was a, an attender of that church, a member of it, and, and her son, over whom she had no legal rights or any legal interest, you might say, but certainly a lot of emotional interest as a mother, uh, was the mother of Bobby, who had been given by the owner to Sarah, in the hopes that this child could grow up and be a help to her in the house, as indeed he did. And so there is a, uh, an ongoing situation here now in which Sarah Osborne, on her own, has this little slave child that's growing up and taking, role, uh, taking a part in her home. That all took place about 1750. 1760 rolls around, and uh, again, Sarah is in remarkably difficult circumstances. She is stretched to the limit financially. She never had much money anyway, but at this point she's really at the edge, trying to think what to do to make her ends meet. She's afraid she might lose her house, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, it occurs to her she could sell Bobby, who's now in his late teens. So uh, she decides to, to do that. She doesn't like the idea. She really loves this kid, and he's been a good help to her, but, but uh, this is what necessity requires. Phyllis, the mother of Bobby, hears what Sarah plans to do, breaks every social convention you can imagine, goes storming into the house of Sarah Osborne and just, just pastes her with accusations at the very thought of getting rid of Bobby. And, and uh, irrespective of financial situations, she just insists this was not, could not happen. Phyllis had no right to do that. She was breaking all kinds of social rules at that point. Sarah herself was, was stunned at the whole situation, being attacked like that. Uh, her first reaction was kind of a negative one to Phyllis, but as she reflected on it later, 
it's like it hit her like an epiphany. This woman, Phyllis, loved her son, Bobby, as much as Sarah herself had loved her son that she lost 10 years earlier. This was a mother. This wasn't just a black woman and a slave, it was a mother. And all I can say to you is Sarah Osborne's heart changed dramatically at that moment. I think that happened occasionally. It's an epiphany that those people that you had always sort of seen as just them became us, at least in her experience. And from that point on, Sarah, of course, she hung on to Bobby, somehow made it through, navigated these challenges, but she began to devote her considerable skills as a Bible teacher and so on, home Bible studies, to addressing her interest to the slave and the uh, former slave population, the black population there in Newport, which was considerable. And over about a five-year period of time, her home became a bit of a center for a ministry of Bible study and so on, especially to black people, Native Americans and others, those who might have been sort of marginalized generally in the society. A lot of other people came too. She became quite well known actually in the church because of this ministry. And that actually helped her a little bit financially as time went on as well. Well, in 1765, some black leaders came to her and said they wondered if they could start using her house as a center for a ministry in the black population in the town, to actually turn her house into a little bit of a separate meeting place for a variety of meetings that would take place virtually every day of the week. And she agreed. And so for about five years, she became probably the most famous person in Newport, Rhode, uh, Rhode Island, having a ministry to black people there in Rhode Island. And it was, uh, she was well-loved, well-respected, and many others came, of course, and sat under her. She was quite a competent Bible teacher and so on, uh, carrying on her ministry in that setting. All right, so she was known as a pretty firm um, opponent of the whole institution of slavery because of this long ministry she'd had to black people there. And when the pastor was fired, he, who had been of a very different attitude toward the whole issue of slavery, blamed her, you see, thinking she had sabotaged him because they had a difference of opinion on slavery. Now that's not true, that's not what happened, but he was trying to blame somebody and so that was uh, sort of the way that uh, he fired his uh, parting shot. Well, Samuel Hopkins heard about all of this. He heard there was an, uh, an opening at the church, first church, and he thought, well, he'd throw his hat in the ring, you know? There were others, there was quite a few others that actually applied for the job. He'd been at the church he was in for 25 years, uh, felt that he'd probably run his course there, and so he actually uh, decided to apply for the job. As I say, he had been trained by Jonathan Edwards. He was a thoroughgoing Calvinist, uh, and uh, this time he'd had in the Housatonic tribe there was now reaching an end. So he came and preached a candidating sermon in the church, first church, and then he was invited to come and preach at Sarah Osborne's home to a largely black gathering of several hundred people that were gathered there, and he preached outdoors to them as well. And it became immediately apparent, of course, as he was preaching to them, that he had a huge uh, depth of affection for them. His experience with the Native Americans had sort of sensitized him to this whole race issue that was uh, sort of behind the scenes going on at that point. And so uh, it was quite clear what his views of these things were. And, uh, and so he preached a pretty decent sermon, after which he lamented to Sarah how lousy a preacher he was. He felt like, you know, of course, he was comparing himself to George Whitfield. Uh, he was comparing himself to Jonathan Edwards, uh, to Gilbert Tennant, to some of the most brilliant preachers probably in the history of this country, I think we'd be safe to say. And so, you know, he compared himself to them, and I didn't feel that he fared so well. But Notwithstanding that, Sarah Osborne believed this was a man who really could fill an important role in this city at this time, and she strongly supported the church hiring him, and the church did hire him. And so he became the pastor of First Church, and immediately there was an outrageous outpouring of protest uh, 
from other pastors in the city because Samuel Hopkins was known to be opposed to the institution of slavery and really wanted to view the black people there as absolutely equal to everybody else and deserving of the same level of ministry and interest and so on. And the city just wasn't quite ready for it yet. One of the most vocal critics of Samuel Hopkins was a fellow by the name of Ezra Stiles. He was a quite well-known pastor himself. He was a scholar. He actually eventually became the seventh president of Yale University. This was a few years later, but that's the quality of fellow he was. He wrote a vitriolic condemnation of Samuel Hopkins that was published as an op-ed in the local paper uh, just the following week. Hopkins himself was so shaken by the outpouring of rage that he immediately resigned. He wasn't ready for this frying pan and uh, had no idea that there was going to be this kind of reaction. Well, he resigned and the church accepted with, with reluctance his resignation, but it was customary to preach a farewell sermon. He'd been there maybe for a month or two, and so he was given an opportunity to preach a farewell sermon. This is where the old expression, what do you got to lose, comes into play, you know. And so he preached a farewell sermon. And he probably doubled down on the views that he had on the issue of slavery, on the abusive kind of attitudes that people had. And it was a sermon that was so powerful that even his critics were moved to tears by it. It was published, and even Ezra Stiles, who had been the, the most vocal opponent, publicly apologized, said he'd gotten it wrong. And he actually pled with First Church to hang on to this guy, to make him the pastor, and Ezra Stiles actually preached his installation sermon. That's the kind of reversal that took place in that city. Now, Ezra Stiles, this took a little bit of humility, if you get what I'm saying. He was a man who was carried a lot of weight. And to have that kind of reversal of attitude was uh, not only unexpected, but really just, re just a remarkable uh, affirmation, you might say, of Samuel Hopkins and his ministry. These two men, Ezra Stiles and Samuel Hopkins, actually became close friends hung out together a lot and uh, sort of uh, worked together in a uh, program uh, that continued for many years to come. It is commonly thought that Samuel Hopkins became the greatest pre-revolutionary abolitionist preacher. Uh, so uh, most of us probably never heard his name, you know, before this series, but he at the time became very well known as a man who raised the issue of slavery in such a way that the colonists just couldn't quite ignore what he was saying. He began preaching in First Church and elsewhere sermons that were hostile to the institution of slavery. The first sermon he preached was so powerful it was actually published and distributed. Uh, it's still not, I'm going to say readily available, but if you work hard you can come up with it but uh, it was distributed not only through Rhode Island, but really through the colonies. He was supported by Samuel Osborne, I'm sorry, Sarah Osborne, by Susanna Anthony. He was also supported by Jonathan Edwards, Jr., the son of Jonathan Edwards, who was also strongly opposed to the institution of slavery, uh, had been given a lot of that impulse from his own father, and of course he was supported all through the years by Ezra Stiles. Uh, those who opposed him uh, found a little bit less of a shy guy. He was willing to meet this challenge with fire, and that was exactly what he did. Uh, J.D. Dickey says, uh, Hopkins first spoke against slavery in 1771, and though one family resigned the church, you know, one family left in a church that had, up until that time, had a kind of indifferent attitude toward it, but they'd been so affected by him. One family resigned the church. Many were shocked at the background of the mistreatment so that even Stiles joined in a cooperative effort to raise funds for a missionary society that would work to discourage slavery in Africa. 
Now, that in itself, don't let that get by you. Everybody understood that the wellspring of slavery, not just in the colonies, but in the world, was of course Africa, where Africans were enslaving Africans and selling them. That's what was going on. It was simple as that. It was believed that if you could get back to the source of the slave population that was being carried throughout the world, that this thing could be corrected right back there at that level rather than trying to fight it here, although fighting it here was a worthy thing to do. And so that was the idea, the belief that by sending missionaries not to combat these things with militant ways, but simply to preach the gospel, that the gospel by its intrinsic merit and message would have a tendency to attenuate, you see, the practice of slavery. By the way, I don't know if you know it, but uh, at that time and for some years afterward, approximately 7% of the slaves in the world were found in the colonies, about 7%. 93% of the slavery in the world was elsewhere. We had a relatively modest uh, experiment in slavery. Even uh, when slavery was finally abolished in this country, it continued apace in many, many different parts of the world and continued well into the 20th century. That can be documented. I won't bother with you right now, but if you're interested, I can give you those uh, sources. But the point is, we always had kind of a tiny slice of the pie, but that even here was viewed as too much, and so there was a hope to go back and kind of correct that problem. As years passed, Hopkins gained increasing influence, and using inspiration from Jonathan Edwards, he preached the theme joined by Jonathan Edwards, Jr., who raised the hypocrisy of the practice. Now, this is Jonathan Edwards, Jr. that's being quoted right here. Uh, quote, if it be lawful and right for us to reduce the Africans to a state of slavery, why is it not right for Great Britain, France, or Spain, not merely to exact duties on us, but to reduce us to the same state of slavery to which we reduce them? You know, those are kind of needling questions that were beginning to trouble some consciences in some parts of the colonies. And really, Hopkins was probably the major uh, uh, you know, a, a voice uh, in favor of that. Uh, Hopkins eventually preached in front of the Continental Congress. Hopkins delivered a powerful message on the point of, to the Continental Congress just after, after, that was a few years later, after the signing of the Declaration of Independence. You know what his text was? We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal preached to a lot of guys who had just signed their names to a document standing for that philosophical proposition. And he just sort of raised the obvious problem here. You know, the ele elephant in the room, he just kind of pointed it out, and he did it in a way that certainly uh, was powerful, to say the least. Hopkins predicted that God's judgment would eventually fall on the nation because it permitted the institution to continue. Perhaps, now this is J.D. Dickey, who's a historian, and I guarantee you not a Calvinist. I know that from reading his book quite carefully. But notice what he says. Perhaps only an extreme Calvinist could have been brave enough in 1776 to aim an anti-slavery sermon to a group of revolutionaries that included many slave owners, you know. Uh, you have to believe there was a little bit of awkward squirming in the room as uh, Samuel Hopkins preached uh, this sermon. And uh, so it uh, is a remarkable tribute to him, of course. I might just mention, on, it's kind of as a footnote to this, uh, you know uh, sometimes the Constitution of the United States is accused of being a pro-slavery document. I don't know if you ever heard that. But uh, uh, actually, if you read it, you, write, you find out that it's not exactly pro-slavery. It's what you'd call slavery accommodating. And there's a difference there because of the Constitutional Convention, it became quite clear that the Southern states would never buy off on a Constitution unless there was some allowance for slavery, simple as that. And so the question was, do we surrender the hope of a United States of America, or do we figure out a way to accommodate an institution that many of us don't like very much? And so the accommodation uh, was incorporated. The Constitution itself provided that within 21, year, 21 years of the date of its enactment, 
no further imports of slaves would be permitted. That was viewed as a sunset clause. The hope was that slavery would gradually attenuate over time. No more imports of slaves, and the hope that was that there would simply be a kind of uh, de- you know, decreasing of the, uh, uh, of the uh, presence of that institution here. It didn't work out that way, you all know that. We had to shed a lot of American blood uh, to make that institution go away. But the point is that really in some ways it was Samuel Hopkins who continued to beat the drum for this all through the years that uh, raised this issue to the level that it became so <clears throat> influential. Newport became the center of a massive anti-slavery effort with many separate societies formed to meet the challenge of the day. Over time, Rhode Island passed laws, although Newport remained a center of profit in the institution for years to come. The entire inspiration started with Sarah Osborne, who first drew Hopkins to First Church Newport. Sarah herself fully supported all of Hopkins' efforts and wrote a touching poem. I'm just gonna give you one stanza of this. This is from Sarah Osborne. Those we see here who once have been made slaves to man by horrid sin, now through rich grace in Christ are free, forever set at liberty. And just to wrap up that little point, uh, Sarah Osborne died. She remarried eventually, became Sarah Benjamin. Uh, This is the only photograph, or not photograph, but sketch I could find of her online. Uh, And so here she is uh, toward the end of her life, but this is uh, uh, Sarah uh, Benjamin at this point. Hopkins outlived her by about seven years, became the most powerful anti-slavery voice in the New Republic, author and editor of the memoirs of Jonathan Edwards, Susanna Anthony, uh, Sarah Osborne, all of them thoroughgoing Calvinists. All right. I want to, uh, in the time that I have, which is not much, add one little footnote to our presentation from five weeks ago. A little bit of a correction, all right? So uh, we talked about Thomas Polk, you remember that? This all comes back to you, it should come flooding back into your memory. Thomas Polk, who had, based on a deal he made with the governor in North Carolina, gotten the authorization to start a school the school was going to be called Queen's College. It would be a Presbyterian school, something like the College of New Jersey. All comes back to you, doesn't it? It's been five weeks. Polk fulfilled his commitment. He helped the governor put down the revolt. Now, the first correction I want to give to you is that the governor's name is Governor Tryon, which I was pronouncing Tyrone. So we're correcting the record. The reason I noticed that is because I got a very, very cordial, kind email from somebody who happened to live for some years in North Carolina, Charlotte, you know, and was very familiar with this history. Uh, You always have to be careful who you're preaching to, you know, because sometimes they can fact check you. Anyway, this, this individual sent a very, very kind email, very appreciative appreciated kind of trotting out this history that many people don't know, and said, oh, by the way, just one little point, the guy's name is Tryon, not Tyrone. I said, thank you very much. So if that person ever uh, happens to watch this video uh, sometime in the future, thank you to whoever you are out there. Appreciate that. But anyway, uh, so that's one little correction. Anyway, Tryon had uh, strongly endorsed a Presbyterian school. He was on board with that. The Mecklenburg militia supported him as had been the deal. The Regulator Rebellion was crushed and then the British Board of Trade turned it down. You remember that? And that's where I left it. And I think somebody in the question period afterwards said, well, you know, did Queens College, you know, what happened to it? And the only information I had in my head at the time was that the the school closed without that kind of support, uh, sort of an official sanction. It couldn't uh, continue and it did close. It had been only operating for maybe a matter of months. Uh, Now, what I didn't know, but discovered later, was that Queens College did come into existence 100 years later. So Polk's vision actually was realized, but it wasn't until well into the next century. And now there is in Charlotte, North Carolina, Queens University which as I looked at their material online and so on, I think is probably a college something like Whitworth, you know, connected to the Presbyterians. 
has 2,300 students, College of Arts and Sciences. It is a college with a College of Health that is called the Presbyterian School of Nursing. And it offers certain majors, 34 undergraduate majors, 10 graduate programs. It still continues to be tied to the PCUSA. And so if anybody was curious about that, as Paul Harvey used to say, that's the rest of the story. There really is a uh, Queens College there. So Thomas Polk never lived to see it, but hopefully he's aware of that in, in his e eternal situation there. And with that, I'm gonna wrap things up uh, with three little points. Going back to our conversation about Paul's valedictory. Every Christian should adopt the attitude that we must fight the good fight because we're always confronted with the enemies of Christ and called to put on God's whole armor. Jonathan Edwards had to fight a good fight. George Whitfield had to fight a good fight. The Apostle Paul had to fight a good fight. It's a good fight. It's a fair fight. It's a fight using the weapons of Christ, which are not necessarily bombs and bazookas. They are, in fact, the sword that comes out of the mouth of the rider on the horse, the Word of God. That is our most potent weapon and vastly exceeds the other weaponry of this world. But it is a fight, you know. I saw a newscast just earlier this week, maybe you caught it as well, in which uh, with some of the riots that are happening in the country these days, just now, uh, so many times the target of the riots are churches. Churches being firebombed, being attacked, uh, being disrupted. It's churches, you know, it's Christian people, uh, very much like us, you see, who all of a sudden find themselves in a fight. Well, how do you respond to a fight like that? Uh, it's tempting to fight one way. We're called to fight a very different way, to fight a good fight and to do it uh, in the grace of Christ and with Christian integrity. So Paul called us and he himself did fight a good fight. Every Christian should daily renew a focus on finishing the course because we're in a race and we're called to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Uh, we're in a race and a race always implies a terminal point, a, a, a finish line. And that's a mentality we should all have, isn't it? That we're kind of running, it's not necessarily a sprint, it's more of a long-term marathon, you know, but we have a goal in mind. And we fix our eyes on that goal. The author to the, uh, the Hebrews says, uh, lay aside every sin, the things that so easily beset us, run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, sat down at the right hand of God. He's a great paradigm for us to follow and have the sense of we're going somewhere and our lives are taking us there by the grace of God. And finally, every Christian should embrace a determination to keep the faith because faith is God's gift but it's also our prized possession to be nourished cherished and mobilized in every challenge of the day if you're a Christian person I believe everyone in this room is you are possessed of faith but if you're a Christian person who understands your Bible you know that you didn't do the faith God did the faith in you. By grace you are saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. God gave you that gift. But it's kind of like getting a gift of a house plant. It's a living thing. You didn't give it life. You received a gift of something that was already alive, but you have the ability to make that living thing happy to put it where it gets sunshine gets water gets fertilizer gets nutrients gets a good environment so that the faith grows and flourishes and becomes a lovely indeed maybe dominant expression of the beauty of your house or your life uh, if you put it in a dark closet it ain't gonna do so well you know in the average situation a plant wants certain things to be healthy. And uh, this is what we need to do, keep the faith. So we fight the good fight, finish the course, keep the faith, all in the name of Christ, amen.
So my thoughts are done, but I'd love to hear your thoughts, please. Yeah, the woman Phyllis, you know, I mean, that's one little cameo appearance in history that kind of changed the whole course of history. Thank you. That's excellent. Yeah, that's right. And, and it's a good way of saying, you know, uh, God doesn't always use the big deal people. Sometimes he uses the little nondescripts, you know, to do big things. So go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, she was talking about Phyllis, the mother of Bobby really changed the course of American history by having the courage to just go in and, uh, and you know, let Sarah uh, Wheaton Osborne have a piece of her mind. And, and uh, you know, here's her one little appearance in history that uh, really did have such an impact. Set off a series of events that, that uh, you know, we, we continue to feel it to this day. Thank Could be, I, I'd like to see that because I'd like to, you know, I know, of course, as we've said before, some of the language came from the Mecklenburg Declaration, but that was not part of that language in Mecklenburg. So you may very well, I, I'd, I'd like to take a look at that because that's, uh, that's good. Did you hear that? That uh, Ben Franklin was the one who kind of edited Jefferson's uh, line there, we hold these truths to be self-evident, all men are created equal. Oh, okay, good. What happened in, yeah, what happened in New York City, Long Island? Interestingly, at the time, um, New York City was not nearly the, the major metropolis that we think of. That, that came later. And so in a sense, you might say those surrounding towns in Massachusetts and New York sort of followed the lead of Boston. Boston really led the way. Uh, and the other cities were, were, in a sense, peripheral. It was very important to them. They were watching it closely, affected by it. But, uh, but it was really more the, the, uh, the I incidents in Boston that kind of set the pace. So um, <clears throat> I don't know what most, more to say about that. We, we, you don't find New York being kind of a, a hot spot for these incidents as much as Boston was at the time, but they were certainly, you know, as were many communities. Anyone else? All right, well, thank you all. Let's briefly pray and we'll be dismissed. Our Father, we're grateful for your mercies. We thank you for the remarkable story that has been part of our own heritage. We pray that we would be those who would be faithful representatives, not only of our country and its values, but of <clears throat> much more importantly, uh, the word of God that you've entrusted to us and its values. We thank you for those who've gone before, who've led the way in that regard, and pray that we would be those who follow faithfully as well. By your grace and in the name of Christ, amen.